This is the video for D3.2 on inheritance. It's standard level content and we'll be diving into analysis of inheritance patterns. One of the patterns we need to be able to recognize is that of sex-linked genes and how they are inherited, and we'll look specifically into hemophilia. Hemophilia is a sex-linked recessive disorder. It's a gene found on the X chromosome, and it results in a clotting factor deficiency. So individuals that suffer from hemophilia have a hard time with blood clotting and have excessive bleeding. Females can be carriers, males can not. So there are a few different um, genotypes that are possible here. So females can have two copies of the dominant allele, and in that case they have normal blood clotting. They can be heterozygous, okay, one copy of the recessive allele, and this is a carrier. So a carrier is an individual that has the recessive allele but does not have the symptoms of the disease because it is masked by the dominant allele. So both of these individuals will be normal, so they will not have hemophilia. Only females that are homozygous recessive have hemophilia, okay? So this is the only way for females to get it. They must inherit two recessive alleles. Males, on the other hand, it's quite different because this gene is only found on the X chromosome. So males can either have um, a dominant allele and then nothing on the Y chromosome, in which case they will have normal clotting factors, or the male can have a recessive allele on his X chromosome, and then again, there's nothing on the Y chromosome to um, counteract that. So this male will also have hemophilia. So we say that males cannot be carriers. Carriers carry a recessive allele, but don't have the disease, and that's not possible for males because they only have one allele for that gene. So let's do a Punnett square, let's do a Punnett grid here um, that predicts the outcome of a cross between a male with normal vision and a female who is a carrier. So the male with normal vision, he must have the genotype X with a dominant allele and then a Y. So that means half of his sperm will have this X chromosome and half of his sperm will have a Y chromosome without that gene for that clotting factor. A woman who is a carrier, okay, she is going to have the genotype big H, X big H, X little H. She carries that recessive allele. So half of her eggs are going to have the, chromos the X chromosome with the dominant allele, and half of her eggs are going to have the X chromosome with the recessive allele. It is very important, I know it's a pain, but it's very important that you're writing these in proper notation. So when you fill in your Punnett square, you would fill this in as if you would do this um, any, with any other trait. You're symbolizing the fusion of the male gametes with the female gametes, and we have the following combinations. So this person is a female with regular vision or sorry, a, f a female with regular blood clotting. This person is a male with regular blood clotting, and this person is a female with regular blood clotting, but she is also a carrier. We have one person in here that has hemophilia, and it is this person right here. So if I'm writing my phenotypic ratios, I would write this as three to one. So this is the ratio of individuals that have normal blood clotting versus those that have hemophilia. Of course, you may get questions that ask you to separate the males and the females. So if I have a question that says, what percentage of male offspring would you expect to have hemophilia? Well, it would be 50% because half of the male offspring have, fit, um, have hemophilia. So just be careful there about what questions are asking you for. Part of analyzing inheritance patterns is looking at pedigree charts. Okay, so we're gonna use these pedigree charts to deduce, that means figure out 
patterns of inheritance. So usually that means I'm trying to figure out a genotype of an individual, or I am trying to figure out the nature of an allele, whether it's dominant or recessive or sex linked or not. So let's just back up and make sure we understand how to read these pedigree charts. So circles on a pedigree chart denote a biological female and squares are for males. You pay attention to the questions when you get them, but usually a darkened circle or a darkened square means that they are affected by a genetic disorder. That this open um, circle or open non-shaded circle or square means they are not affected. Now let's talk about the lines in our pedigree chart. A horizontal line, typically we would have said that denotes a marriage, although we know two people don't necessarily have to be married, but I think of it as like producing offspring together. We'll shorten that to say marriage, even though we know that doesn't necessarily mean the same thing. So this horizontal line is a marriage. And then from that, anything directly descending from this vertical line denotes an offspring. So this female and this male had one, two, three children. All of them were girls and one of them had the disease. This female child, this daughter, married this male that does not have the disease and they had one, two, three children, two of whom were boys, one was a girl, and one of their male children had the disease. So we will do a little practice here. Um, let's say I'm looking at an autosomal recessive disease, like let's say PKU, like phenylketonuria, and I have to deduce the genotypes of the individuals in this diagram. The easiest way to start is by looking for the individuals that you know have to be homozygous recessive. If a disease is autosomal recessive, only the people with two copies of that recessive allele are going to have that disease, okay? So I know anytime I see a shaded shape, okay, they must be homozygous recessive. That's the only way to get an autosomal recessive disease. Now, these individuals, okay, have to inherit these alleles from their parent. One allele has to come from one parent the other allele has to come from the other parent. So that means this male must carry a recessive allele, but he does not have the disease, so his other allele must be the dominant allele. When I look at these individuals down here, okay, they get their alleles from their parents. One has to come from their mom, and she can only donate recessive alleles. However, neither one of these individuals has the disease, so they must have a dominant allele. And great, when I'm checking that, that is possible that their father could have passed them that dominant allele. So this allele comes from the dad, and this allele comes from the mom. Okay, now I can expand this into the original generation. This daughter has two recessive alleles, and one had to come from each parent. Okay, now neither one of these parents has the disease, so that must mean that their other allele is dominant, that both of them are carriers. Now, for these two daughters, I know that they have at least one dominant allele because neither one of them has the disease. What I'm not sure of is what the other allele is. Could it be that this individual got a big A from the dad and a big A, or sorry, big A from the mom and a dominant A or dominant allele from the dad? Yes. Is it also possible that they got a dominant allele from the mom and a recessive allele from the dad? Yes, we don't know. Both of these are equally likely. And the same would go for the other daughter as well. So we have to make sure we um, aren't overconfident <laughs> in, our, in our guessing here that this is all based on evidence from patterns of inheritance. Now, genetic disorders tend to be relatively rare. Usually genetic disorders um, prevent an individual from passing along their genes to the next generation. Either it affects their survival or reproduction. So recessive alleles are relatively rare in populations. 
However, when there are um, cases of inbreeding or marriages between close family members, those recessive alleles are overrepresented in both branches of the family and can cause recessive diseases to be much more common than they would be in a population where inbreeding is not taking place. So here I can see in family A that two cousins married. So this cousin and this cousin, I know they're cousins because they share the same grandparents. Um, both of them carry a recessive allele and therefore both of their children just happen to have this disease. We see the same thing happening here in family B. This individual and this individual have the same grandparents. They both carry the same recessive allele, and you can see that several or two of their children have this genetic disorder. So disorders are relatively rare amongst um, broader populations, but become more common with interbreeding because it's more likely that both individuals are carrying the recessive allele. Now, something like blood type um, or even hemophilia, we've been talking about like you can either be this or this. You can either have hemophilia or not have hemophilia. You can either have type A blood, type B blood, type O blood, type AB blood. This is an example of discrete variation. And so when you think about the frequency, you tend to get very defined categories. So if I were looking at blood types, there's four different blood types, and you are either this one, this one, this one, or this one. There's nothing in the middle. So we're going to notice this kind of variation in our data when a trait is controlled by a single gene, okay? So that single gene causes them to fall within distinct categories. And this is also a, a case where there's no environmental influence. Not all traits are controlled by a single gene. In fact, for humans, many of our visible traits are controlled by multiple genes. They are what we call polygenic, multiple genes. And we don't get this clear distinction into categories. Instead, if you plot the frequency, you get a continuous variation. So some kind of clustering around the mean and then less of the extreme phenotypes, but someone's phenotype can fall anywhere along a range change. This is also a case where we're going to see a pretty significant environmental influence, which also explains why we have such a broad range. So for example, skin color. Skin color is controlled by many genes, and it's also influenced by the environment. So we would see a much more continuous variation here. Let's say that you collected data on something that showed continuous variation like student height and you looked at heights in three different classes and you wanted to represent how those uh, heights varied amongst those groups of students. You might use something like this box and whisker plot to display your data. Box and whisker plots have a few different features that we need to be aware of. They use the median, um, not the mean, but the median to determine the quartiles. So if I think about this being the median, that means half of my samples are going to be above the median and half of my samples are going to be below. One quarter, the, the quarter that is directly um, or higher or greater than the median is going to be represented here, and one quarter that is lower than the median is going to be represented here. So here's half of my data. The upper quartile will be here outside of the box, and the very, very uh, most extreme data point will be here, and then my lower quartile will be here with my last data point here. Okay, so this is how we get what's called the interquartile range, and that will be important when we're determining outliers in just a moment. Some students have the bad habit of um, writing about their data and saying, oh, I decided not to include this point, it's an outlier. Well, how did you determine that that was an outlier? Visually looking at it or just it doesn't fit what you wanted to happen, that's not good enough. There's actually a mathematical way to determine outliers. So what we do is we take the value for the third quartile and subtract the first quartile. And that's how you're getting that interquartile range. You take the interquartile range and multiply it by 1.5. 
you can add that value to the boundary for the um, third quartile, and then we can subtract it from the first quartile. Anything outside of the range um, that you get here can be mathematically um, included, or I should say mathematically excluded as an outlier. But just be careful. A, I would really practice this with some examples, but B, I would also be very careful about determining what makes something an outlier. If you're going to write about data and you wanna say something is an outlier, you must use this mathematical determination.